a political intelligence firm for CEOs and government officials. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. It's good to be with you. And so we have a lot to talk about. First and foremost, I want to know your reaction to the impeachment acquittal. I mean, no witnesses being called. And unfortunately, Trump is also mentioned in other in about 4,000 other lawsuits. So he may have gotten a slap on the wrist for this, but it's safe to say that he has a lot of things coming his way. Sure. Listen, Ashley, it's no surprise, unfortunately, that Trump was acquitted uh, from this heinous crime that was caught on videotape uh, several weeks ago. But I think to the point that you made, the reality here is that while he escaped this, thanks to partisan Republicans who chose um, party over country, he's facing a number of state lawsuits, specifically in New York surrounding fraud uh, that he is engaged in for his businesses and a number of other areas. And so those investigations uh, are separate from uh, the immunity that he enjoyed as, pr as president. And so it's clear to me that some justice will be served. It may not be at the federal level, but it looks like it may be at the state level. And let's talk about something interesting here that has happened, of course, after the trial. Censuring of Pat uh, Toomey because of his vote to impeach, now he's being considered a rhino or Republican in name only. Can you talk about that? I know he's not, what, he's not the only one going through this. Well, it's incredibly interesting because Pat Toomey is one of the most conservative Republicans in the Senate. If you look at his voting record, it has been pro-Trump 99.9999% of the time. And so the idea that these Pennsylvania Republican officials would, would censure him and say it's because he voted to convict the president, um, it's completely outrageous. But if you look at uh, the reality of the situation, one of the Republican officials in Pennsylvania who voted for this said that we didn't send him to Washington to do the right thing. And I think that says it all in terms of their perspective on what they expect from their elected officials. And to your point, this has happened throughout the country and a number of other states. Um, and I think Utah is an interesting perspective here in terms of you had Mitt Romney who voted to convict. Uh, you had uh, Senator Lee who voted uh, to acquit. And, and Mitt Romney did not face censure from the Republicans in his party. They saw that as an opportunity to say, we have a diverse party with diverse perspectives. Uh, and so we let them do their job in Washington and we'll do our job here. I think if the Republicans hope to have a future and get out of this vicious civil war that they're in right now, uh, I think that's all they can hope for. To be perfectly honest with you, it doesn't look good for them. Uh, there was a recent poll that showed that 64% of Republicans would leave the party to join a Trump party if he created one. I think that is problematic. I think the fact that coming out of this impeachment trial, the fact that 58 percent of Americans said that he should have been convicted is problematic. I think it's also problematic that if Republicans hope to take back the House next November, they'll need a number of independents to support them in that quest. They need a number of moderate Republicans to support them in that quest. And 64 percent of independents said that Trump should have been convicted. And so it's not clear to me that they have a path forward. I think for the betterment of our country, we need a strong Republican Party and a strong Democratic Party. And the civil war right now that's happening between the Trump wing and the Romney wing is not good for anyone. It's almost as if the Republican Party is trying to find itself all over again. It truly is. And, and to, to the point that you've made, it's trying to find itself in the midst of this sea of chaos that it has stirred up on its own. I would argue that what we witnessed on January the 6th started more than 10 years ago uh, with the rise of the Tea Party uh, mm -hmm. in reaction to the election of America's first black president. And all of the horrific things that came out of that from uh, sort of the, the, the rise in, um, in attacks in terms of the president online and people criticizing him in a racist and hateful way, I think, if you remember around 2010, uh, John Lewis, the iconic congressman from Georgia and civil rights leader, was spat on as he walked to the Capitol for a vote by Tea Party rioters who had descended upon the Capitol. And I think that this has been a long time coming, and they have to figure that out for themselves. And yes, may he rest in peace, definitely left an impact. But first and foremost, I also do want to ask you, what does it mean to censure a legislator for those who might not understand all of this? 
it means absolutely nothing. When a state party censures an elected representative, it means absolutely nothing. Now that is separate from a censure that happens in Congress. So the Senate or the House can censure a member. And the way that works is you have a vote before the full House, for instance, to censure someone. That can pass with a simple majority. And once that passes, a number of things can happen in terms of what that means. And that's decided by party leadership. So that would be Speaker Pelosi or Kevin McCarthy. Uh, and they work to figure out what that censure means. But the censure that has happened for these senators and members at a local level has no connection to Washington. It, it has no influence on their ability to do their jobs. Uh, it's only sort of a, an empty gesture uh, on behalf of the local party. And let's talk about some of the other legislators who are actually going through this process, um, essentially being punished for mm -hmm. their vote to impeach uh, former President Donald Trump. I know we have the senator from Nebraska who they're saying, you know, was saying Trump's lies caused this. And so people are upset that he's now he said that. And Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina, Senator Bill Cassidy from Louisiana. I mean, the list just goes on and on, on and on. Excuse me, Representative Liz Cheney from Wyoming. What, what can we expect? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is almost a, a way of House being divided again. It's interesting that the party that fancies itself to be the party of law and order, the party of uh, police, and the party of law enforcement uh, has stood by, and they have allowed Trump to get off on this vicious crime where five people lost their lives, where police officers lost their lives and were assaulted uh, viciously, and many of them had broken ribs in a number uh, of other injuries. And so the idea that this happens on January the 6th, the idea that it's caught on tape, mm -hmm. and we see these individuals who have committed this crime, and we see Trump inciting these people and encouraging them and engaging with them, and then complimenting them after the crime has been carried out, is, uh, is completely insane. But I think it speaks to where the Republican Party is in terms of crime was committed, we see evidence of the crime, and he's let off. And I think, you know, you mentioned a little earlier the idea of there were no witnesses and what that means for the trial. I would say in that situation, you had 100 witnesses already. Every single republic, I'm sorry, every single senator who voted in this trial was a witness. They were there that day. They fled for their lives as these terrorists stormed the Capitol. And so you had 100 witnesses then. You also had video footage uh, of this crime. And so from my perspective, I don't think you needed witnesses additionally because you already had 100 witnesses, you already had video evidence. And let's just be perfectly honest here. There was nothing that was going to cause the Senate Republican conference to vote to convict Donald Trump. We could have rolled out 1,000 witnesses and that would have changed nothing. And uh, let me ask you this. Do you think that Democrats will invoke Section 3 of the 14th Amendment now that Trump has been acquitted? I think they won't for two reasons. The first reason is the way that it's written in the Constitution is nebulous. It's not exactly clear how it should be carried out. So, for instance, with impeachment and removal, it says the president can be removed from the Senate with two-thirds vote. With this particular portion of the Constitution, it says that someone shall not serve as president if they have participated in an insurrection. But it doesn't go the extra step of saying this is how you fix that situation. And so there are two camps in terms of the way legal scholars see this. One side says that you can move forward with a resolution in the Senate uh, and remove the president. Uh, and the other side says you probably have to in involve courts and judges in this decision as they figure out a way to move forward. Either way, you're looking at several months of sort of chaos and calamity around what's going to happen. And those are months that could better be spent passing this $1.9 trillion economic rescue package from the president. You've got more than 10 million Americans out of work. You have millions of Americans facing eviction. And so you have to get that done. The other idea here is you deal with this situation next November. The way that you punish Trump is you punish his party in the midterm, in the midterm election. And that's the way that you carry out justice in this situation. But there's no way that they're going to be able to move forward um, with sort of further sanctions for Trump outside of the initial impeachment that has already passed in the House. Mm. Michael Hardaway, it's tough to digest that we would probably